Everybody, welcome to Two of the First for today, October the 19th, 2022. Good to have you here with us. I am Ryan Balangi, and we are presented by our friends at French Lake Resort in French Lake, Indiana. We have two stories for you today, two topics for you, really, as the name of the show implies. And if you want to get a hold of me about the show or anything related to golf, you can hold me on Twitter, easiest place to find me, at Ryan Balangi, or you can follow Golf News social media service at the handle Golf News Net. So, we've got two things to kind of talk about today, a little bit of kind of expounding upon yesterday's show to a degree, so hopefully you got a chance to listen to that. Thank you for the support uh, on the video side, also on golfnewsnet.com, as well as uh, through your podcasting services and audio ways that you're listening to us. It's, it's, it's really great. Uh, I really appreciate it. So, building upon yesterday's story about the four rotating elevated events on the PGA Tour schedule, I think we have to kind of get into what is the natural follow-up to that subject of what happens to the rest of the PGA Tour schedule that isn't elevated. Because it, let's take the elevated events that we have. There are going to be 17 of them. So you're going to have the four majors, the three FedEx Cup playoff events, the players, the three special invitationals, Tigers, Arnies, and Jacks. You're going to have the WGC Dell Technologies match play. And then you're going to have four tournaments that rotate every year. And for 2023, based on reporting from Eamon Lynch at Golf Week, those tournaments are the Travelers Championship, the Phoenix Open, the Heritage, and the Wells Fargo Championship. So that's 17 events on the schedule. Well, on the PJ Tour schedule, there are 47 tournaments. Now you have a whole bunch of opposite field events, right? You've got those that are opposite the, either the Open Championship or the WGC or the Arnold Palmer Invitational. So you've got Puerto Rico, you've got Kentucky, you've got Tahoe. You've got events there that are not necessarily going to be in that conversation of what, what happens to those. And then we also have to kind of throw out about nine tournaments that are the current fall schedule. Now, we don't know what the, the fall is going to look like come 2023 entirely, but we know that those tournaments that are going to be in that portion of the schedule are going to not be events that earn FedEx Cup points. They're not going to be events that really probably attract top players whatsoever. Uh, most of those players are probably going to consider going to play either on the DP World Tour if they have that kind of membership and they want to go chase the DP World Tour points title and, and the money that comes with that. They could just take it off. They may play one event or, or two just to kind of keep fresh. But by and large, those events aren't going to have really strong fields. You're not going to see a whole lot of top 50 players competing because those events are going to become effectively a very long Q school, a very long FedEx Cup playoffs for players that need to keep status, that aren't in the top 70, that didn't qualify for the playoffs, which have now shrunk this year from 125 getting in to 70 getting in, going 70-50-30 instead of 125-70-30. So that's what the fall is going to become. So those, those tournaments aren't going to be elevated, whatever number of them there are. But there are nine of them now. They're going to go, go away. Now, we could talk about that, and we should talk about what happens to something like the CJ Cup and what happens to something like the Zozo Championship. Do those tournaments get put back into place elsewhere? Do they go away? What happens with that? And I want to table that for a second. We'll come back to that. So we've got about four tournaments, five tournaments that are opposite field events. So we'll, we'll take four of them. And we've got the nine fall events. We take them out of the equation. So take 13 tournaments out of the equation. Now you have 33 tournaments because you go from 47 down to 33 that really are, are factored in here. So you've got 16 tournaments that are have not, so to speak, and you have 17 tournaments that are haves. That doesn't sound as bad as it once did, right? When you, when you said, hey, we've got 17 elevated events and we've got 47 total events. Now you have 30 that don't fit. Well, you throw out the 13 14 that really don't matter uh, to this discussion because they're not attracting top players anyway. Now you've got 16, 17 events that fit in there somewhere that need some help, that, that aren't in that top tier status. Now some of those are in the Florida swing, right? You've got the Innisbrook event. You've got the Honda Classic. You've got events on the West Coast swing. So you've got the American Express. You've got the Sony Open in Hawaii which always seems to attract a pretty decent field anyway because it's Hawaii. And then you've got the Farmers Insurance Open. You've got the at t Pebble Beach, which is probably not ever going to become an elevated event because of just the nature of the tournament. They're, they're not going to change that for one year, so you can probably discard that. That one's not 
necessarily a concern. You've got the John Deere Classic, which is just kind of what it is, and, and I don't see it really necessarily changing. It could on a one-year basis, and it would be really cool if almost all the top 50 showed up to TPC Deer Run. I, I, that would be great for that tournament, but probably not likely. So we're, we're talking about three or four tournaments that probably aren't necessarily going to be in that, that conversation. Now we're really down to about a dozen tournaments that every year are going to need some help. They're going to need better fields. And I think that's actually not as bad as it sounded at the start of the exercise, right? And I was kind of working through this yesterday thinking, all right, well, we've got all these tournaments and you've got all the top players, the top 20 or 25 players agreeing to play these 17 tournaments if they're eligible. But what are they going to do for the others? Well, now you've got it down to about a dozen tournaments that, that really are affected most by this reality of elevated events. And each of those top players is allowed to have three starts outside of this agreed to number of events that they're going to play, these elevated events that they're going to play. So you're going to have players compete events that are probably their pet projects, whether it's their hometown event, whether it's an event they are either intimately involved with or they have family near, or maybe it's just one they play really, really well and they like to clean up at. You're, you've got some options there. And with most of the players being American, they're going to stay in the United States for those tournaments. And that's going to help some tournaments and probably hurt others, right? But for the most part, it'll probably be about a net neutral. You're going to have probably fewer tournaments that have fields that are kind of like the 3M Open was this year. Uh, really kind of not great uh, where you're digging so deep into the, the alternate list where you exhaust it even in the case of the 3M, which I've never seen happen before until this year. So you're going to have those tournaments out there in the universe but they're not going to be as bad. And you're going to have some tournaments that probably elevate a little bit because maybe they get the, a rotational start from a top player or a handful of top players, and maybe they just kind of decide to, to move themselves around. We'll see if they're coordinated in that fashion. But the one thing that I think is really important to bring up in all of this, and it's something John Rahm brought up, and I, I think it's something that's going to continue to come up until there's an official podcast, is how do you decide those three events? And if you are a joint member with the DP World Tour, how do you get to your membership number while still agreeing to play in all of these co-sanction or all of these elevated events? Because you have to keep DP World Tour status to be eligible for the Ryder Cup. Obviously the top players born in Europe want to be eligible for the Ryder Cup. So they have to consider a scenario where at the PGA Tour they say in Ryder Cup years and Ryder Cup qualification periods, those three events can be DP World Tour events. And it could be any of them. Doesn't matter, but they have to be DP World Tour events, not co-sanctioned events. There's a very specific, uh, you have to have four, four or five DP World Tour events every year that you're eligible for that are not co-sanctioned. You have to compete in them to maintain your membership. So you got to allow these players to take those three events and go in Ryder Cup years, go play the DP World Tour and support that tour. I think that's a big win, not only for those players, but also for this strategic alliance, so to speak, with the DP World Tour, where frankly, uh, and I understand people's frustration about this, particularly on the other side of the pond, the DP World Tour is not getting a whole lot out of it other than a cash infusion from the PGA Tour owning a, a large chunk of DP World Tour productions, uh, effectively owning a backdoor way to own the, the DP World Tour in many ways. So for the PGA Tour, they've got to be able, and by the way, they're taking the 10 best eligible players from the DP World Tour points list and giving the PGA Tour status. Again, you're kind of poaching players. Uh, I think you need to be able to kind of give that back. You need to be able to support that tour and you need to be able to give these players the opportunity to really bounce back and forth between the PGA Tour and the DP World Tour. And it doesn't have to be just the Europeans. Uh, Billy Horschel has kind of found a, some interesting support for the DP World Tour in the last couple of years in the pandemic. Uh, I think some other players would give it a look if you told them, hey, we would it'd be great if you went and supported the Rolex series events or if you went and supported particular national opens that interest you or the, the Alfred Dunhill Links Championship, whatever those events are. But support them and kind of put that all together. Uh, I think that's really important for the PGA Tour to get that part of it right. I think they got the part right about having a rotation of elevated events. They would get it even more right if they had a rotation of elevated events that could include DP World Tour events. I would love, love, love that. Uh, even if it were just the ones that the PGA Tour is really working on right now. If you made the Scottish Open uh, an elevated event leading into the Open Championship, 
you'd have an incredible banger for a couple of weeks for that part of the world. You could bring elevated events to Asia, and, and I, I wanted to kind of pull that all the way back to the original parking lot that we had for the CJ Cup and for the Zozo Championship. I mean, those are tournaments with long-term contracts for the PGA Tour. They have to find a place to make these events work for those sponsorships. And I'm wondering if whatever the PGA Tour eventually comes up with for this currently tabled idea of a te team series or uh, an elites-only set of events, whether or not that, that doesn't include the Zozo and the CJ Cup, and maybe you take something in Dubai and put that in into the mix with the DP World Tour, something like that, bringing that all together. I, I think you could see a world where those key fall series events with the biggest purses wind up becoming part of something bigger, where the fall series is the fall series to keep your card, but you have maybe three, four tournaments that keep the top players fresh. You throw a boatload of money at them. You keep a super limited field. Maybe they're not even official World Golf ranking events. You know, they, they don't even have points if, if you wanted to go that way because you're, you're hurt now because you don't have as many players in field. So limited field events are actually hurt. I think that's the case to not change the field sizes for the elevated events that are rotating. But if you take some of these events like the CJ Cup, like the Zozo, maybe Ned Bank, I, I don't know, but whoever you can kind of get involved and agree to it and make that a four event series in the and just let players compete. Give them a, a, an access to an enormous pool of money, you know, $100 million, basically, 80 to $100 million, and you let them go play around the world. Uh, people in the United States are not paying as much attention to golf. We, we know it works, even after the last couple of years. This year has been a real reversion back to the way fall used to be perceived as, frankly, not worth a lot of people's time. So you can take these events around the world. It's not going to necessarily hurt what you would have gotten on TV. You can take the game other places. You can kind of plant your flag where you need to. Uh, I think that makes a whole lot of sense. Will that happen? I don't know. I don't have any intel that tells me that. But that those are two clear tournaments that need a home once the fall series becomes the fall series again. And there isn't a whole lot of room on the PGA Tour schedule for an Asia swing. So I don't see how they bring that into the fold very effectively. They're going to have to push that out to a series of events that are operating the fall against or concurrent with what the new fall series is going to be. I think that could be really compelling and interesting. Also, just enough amount of you know team golf, individual golf, if you did that, where it would be interesting but not overkill. Um, that, that's kind of how I see it. I, and I realize that there would probably be some copying of live to a degree and that I have to acknowledge that. But I, I think that's where you're going. So you don't really necessarily have huge problems with these three events that float for the top players. You've got about a dozen events to pick from that'll probably matter to that question mark. But you've got these events in the fall you're taking out of the equation. You've got a couple you got to to really preserve because they're good paydays for players. Um, I mean, the, the, the purse this week for the CJ Open is $10.5 million. It was $11 million last week in Japan. There's no reason to just kick those tournaments to the curb when they're good high-paying opportunities for players. If that means shrinking the field and getting a guarantee that you have top players involved, okay, we'll see what happens there. But I think there's probably more to come on that. Just just guessing. Don't know that for sure. All right, so what about Congaree? We've got Congaree as our kind of second story. It's a little bit of a mystery this week. It hosts the, the CJ Cup in South Carolina. It, it's kind of become the de facto one-off host for the PGA Tour, and this has been a vagabond event, the, the CJ Cup. After a couple, what, three years they had in South Korea at Nine Bridges, you had Justin Thomas win a couple of times, you had Brooks Kepka win, them, and then you had a move to the United States forced by the pandemic. You had two years in Las Vegas, one in Shadow Creek, one at the Summit, so you had what Jason Kokrak win, and you had uh, Rory McIlroy win last year, and then they, they didn't identify the West Coast venue for this year, so they I guess, scrambled and went to Congaree and said, hey, we need you, and they said yes. And Congaree, which is in Ridgeland, South Carolina, it's, it's not that far from Paris Island, uh, where the United States Marines trains uh, its recruits, and it's not that far from Savannah and Hilton Head Island. But I think Congaree's trying to angle for a, a bigger event. They're trying to angle for something they can have annually, and doing this, they, they think that maybe it's a way of doing that. I think the players are going to really like this golf course, sounds like so far 
the feedback is that they do. Jordan Spieth came on uh, the press conference, press conference room yesterday. He said he arrived on site, I guess, on Monday and played. He said he'd never seen the club before and really, really liked it. I mean, it is one of the longer courses on the PGA Tour. Third longest they're going to play this season behind Torrey South and Corrales Golf Club, which is in the Dominican Republic. So this is going to be the second longest golf course star players are going to see this year, probably. So, or for this season, I should say. And the, for, for Speed to say he really likes the golf club, I mean, it's a, it's a great endorsement. JT Poston, I, I understand, is a member. I'm sure there are probably a couple South Carolina-based players that, that are members at, at Congaree, or as they say, they're ambassadors, they're not members uh, for Congaree. But the, the interest level in this Fazio design is seems to be high. And I, I think one of the unique characteristics of it is something Spieth talked about in the news conference in that you, when you play a golf course, you kind of expect a certain look and feel flow to the golf course. You expect one hole to feed to the next, to look like the next, to kind of lead you on a linked journey of 18 holes. And Congaree is not like that. There are a lot of holes that are just kind of unto themselves. And, and there's an inspiration from the sand belt of Australia, a little bit of Lynx inspiration, a little bit of Heathland inspiration from the UK, and then obviously Low Country because that's where they are in South Carolina. All of this together to create a golf course uh, that is 7,600 some odd yards from the tips, has a mixture of really long par fours, a couple short ones, some medium to long par threes, some really long par fives. And so the distance is there. You've got kind of trees that shape a lot of holes, but you also have a lot of decisions you can make because there's not a lot of rough. There's not going to be a whole ton of chipping from deep grass that just doesn't exist on this property. But there are greens that are pretty tricky, and they're going to run pretty firm and fast. So this is a golf course, I think, that is a really good one. And so far, the players seem to like it. Now, there always kind of has to be a level of, uh, not skept yeah, I guess skepticism, about players really liking a golf course. And one, that's because PJ Tour players kind of have certain expectations for golf courses. They expect them to be pristine. They expect them to kind of work in their favor. And, and they don't like golf courses that befuddle them. They don't like golf courses that don't leave it out there in front of them. I mean, there are some that do. But by and large, the vocal ones love the golf courses that you see it from the tee, you see it revealed to you, you know what you have to do. There aren't mysteries and surprises. Uh, and you can kind of play a clear strategy on every hole. They like it. And, and it seems like you have a lot of options at Congaree about how you want to play the golf course, whether you're a longer hitter, uh, a shorter hitter, not a short hitter, but a shorter hitter, and how you prefer to play your short game. So I think we're going to see a whole lot of different types of golf this week. You're probably going to see some low scores. I'm guessing we're going to see a 15, 16 under winning score this week. Uh, I don't know if there's a, I know there's props for that, but I don't know what the over-under is for that in the betting market. Uh, if you're interested in that, we'll talk about that on the press right after we record this, our golf betting podcast. But I, I really like that they have this venue here in Congaree, and I have a feeling they're going to try to put something together that, that's longer term at this venue. Again, not sure what that is, and, and really not sure where on the schedule it's going to move to, but I, I think they're angling for that, or they're angling for a day where they can be a home to like a PGA Championship which seems to be thinking about moving around to a variety of different courses now that they're in May. This could be a venue that could work for them. But again, you got to get logistics and all that stuff right. But you could do it. It could be done. And it feels like Congaree, which does have this mission of trying to expose more people to golf, even outside of its membership, by bringing in uh, a diverse set of people to be able to practice and play at the facility, to be able to have diversity of people, membership, all that stuff. And that this kind of ties in with that mission, perhaps. And it, I think it's a solid venue. So I'm looking forward to watching it this week. Um, obviously, as I said, we know people aren't paying as much attention. But this is really the event of the fall. You have 30 of the world top 50 competing this week. Several players have said this is their only official PGA Tour start of the fall. And they're probably not going to compete after this in an official event unless... Perhaps they're playing on the DP World Tour. Unlikely, because they're going to be seen as poachers or hardly having played the whole season. But, but some will go and play. And then you're going to have players compete in the 20-man Hero World Challenge in December. Some will compete in that. A couple are going to play in the PNC Championship. Now the kind of the, the guys who are about 30 
uh, are playing with their dads as part of that tournament. You got Tiger involved. That's kind of changed the nature of the, that event. But going forward next year, there just are. There's not going to be like this in the fall, at least unless this team concept manifests itself or this top elite player series manifests itself. And even then, that's going to go around the world. It's not going to probably be friendly to people in the United States time zones when the main, in, at least in the lower 48. So uh, this is kind of a, a last of its breed. A fall event with a great field. The WGC HSBC Champions is gone. It is gone away. And the PGA Tour's invo involvement in China is effectively finished, as, as best we can tell. They're not resurrecting PGA Tour Series China. That's that's pretty much toast. They only talk about Latino America and Canada. This event China has gone away. So that is a change. But the whole structure of the fall is about to change. The whole nature of having these kind of big events in the fall, even one or two of them is going to change. So appreciate this week for what it is, kind of one of those final opportunities for a while to have uh, one fall event that, that has a really great field in it. And that's on the PGA Tour. So hopefully that seeding of the ground to maybe the DP World Tour could mean something for the players uh, and that strategic, strategic alliance. We'll see what happens with that. All right, that's going to do it for us today on Two Up the First. Thank you so much for your support. And listening to the program, if you catch us on your favorite podcasting service, please leave us a good review. It helps us reach more people. And we will talk to you tomorrow with another episode of Two Off the First.